So 2 Samuel 11 is where we will be tonight. Amen. Um, we're going to be looking at that story. Last week we looked at David as a young man who had not yet become king, who had been anointed king, and who the Lord had called a man after his own heart. And we saw his righteousness as he was given the opportunity to kill Saul in a cave, but yet he refused to do so. He said, far be it for me that I should strike against the Lord's anointed, that I should raise my hand against him. And he does him good instead of evil, even though by any reasonable worldly standard, David would have been well within his rights to kill Saul because Saul had done evil against him, had tried to kill him, had forced him to flee to a cave, and had had him on the run. And so if anybody had legitimate grounds, it would have been David, but he said no. Because it was the Lord's anointed, and he knew that the Lord had made him king, and that the Lord would be the one that would make him the next king in his time. And that he had to be patient and trust in the Lord. And there's so much to learn in that when we look at circumstances. And if we're not careful, if we're not in the word of the Lord, if we're not praying, if we're not in tune with what God expects from us, it can be easy to misinterpret circumstances like David's men and go, surely the Lord has handed him to you today. This is a victory for you. Look at the circumstances. God's will is clear. You, you, you need to kill Saul. But that wasn't the will of God. The circumstances could have been interpreted multiple ways. And having the wisdom and the discernment to be able to look at circumstances, to be able to look at a situation that you are in, that you are faced with, and to be able to know what is right, to be able to have confidence in what is right, requires that you know the word of the Lord, that you understand what God wants from you, that you know the difference between what is right and what is wrong. And as we talked about last week, there is never a right time to do the wrong thing so that you can do right later. You know, David would have had to have murdered Saul in order to become king, and then he could think about, well, if I'm king, think of all the good I can do as king. And so the Lord's delivering him into my hands. If I just do this one thing, then I'll be king, and then I can do all sorts of good. And that's an example that we need to think about because sometimes we're tempted with doing something wrong, but we think about, well, if I do, then I can have all of this, and then think of what I can do with that. But that never works out. And so we see in David's early life a commitment to righteousness and to be chasing after the Lord with all of his heart and with all of his soul and with all of his might. He's a man after God's own heart. But David is human. And he has a sinful nature just like each and every one of us. And one of the things that gives me such hope and encouragement and also conviction that the Bible is true, is that when we look at people in the Bible, they don't get whitewashed. They don't get sanitized. They don't get the bad parts of them deleted. When we see stories in the Bible, we see the good, we see the bad, we see the ugly. We see it all. You know, Peter was the guy that Jesus built the church around. He was the leader after Jesus. He's also the guy that denied Jesus three times. We see the good and we see the bad. We see the same here. And that's a great confirmation to me that it is the truth. Because if I'm writing my own story, and it's not inspired by God. If the Holy Spirit is not in control of the story, then I am going to write a story that presents me in the best possible light. 
I'm going to leave out the bad parts. You know, kind of like when you watch propaganda for a dictatorship. You know, if you ever see any kind of news coverage from North Korea, you know, and they talk about the dear leader, and the dear leader is perfect, and the dear leader never makes any mistakes, and, you know, he never gets sick, and whatever. Just pick your, the guy's perfect. They delete out all of his deficiencies. Because he's writing his own story. And so he's not going to have reported things that he's doing wrong because he doesn't like the way that that reflects on him. And that's human nature. You know, if you ever go to an art museum or you ever look at portraits, especially in the Renaissance era, it was super, super common when you see a portrait that that's not the first take. It's very common when you look at portraits, if you go to an art museum and you've seen x-rays or you study them, that underneath that portrait is a different portrait, a first portrait. And, you know, whoever bought the portrait, whoever ordered the portrait from that artist, they show up to take delivery and they look at it and they go, eh, I don't think so. I look too fat. I don't look strong enough. You've made me look too old. You've made me, you know, the scar on my face. I wanted that gone. Whatever. They want a best version of themselves. We do the same thing today. I mean, it's almost impossible now to get on Instagram or Facebook and see an actual legitimate photograph of a female, of a woman. And a lot of guys, too. I mean, they AI, and they touch up, and they smooth the skin, and they get rid of the wrinkles, and they delete the gray hair, and, you know, I'm, I look at some of these photos, and I, you know, you get done looking at somebody's profile photos, and at the end of it, you really have absolutely no idea what they look like in real life. You know, if that's the only photo that exists of them, and they get kidnapped, that photo is not going to help them be found, because if they put that on the news... And that's the photo that's on the news, and somebody sees them at a gas station, that photo won't help because that photo's 50 pounds too light, it's 20 years too young, and its thickness of hair is completely different. And I'm, yeah, it's a great looking piece of art, but it is not representative of you. But that's our human nature. We want to see the best image of ourselves, that's what we do. I do it too, I don't mess with the imaging on the and the editing of the photos. I, don't, I haven't gone that far yet, but you know, I want to make sure I'm in the right light, I want the right angle, like, you know, wanna, you know I, I try to get my best angle for sure in a photo. I don't go to the extreme of, let me digitally edit myself back 10 years, but people do. And that's no different than what's been going on through all of history. Because people don't like to look and see the truth. They don't like to see reality. They prefer to see an idealized version of themselves. Winston Churchill famously burned an official portrait that was taken of him. He sat for an artist, the artist painted him over the course of several visits, and it was a gift from Parliament to him as a retirement portrait. It was unveiled, and it was accurate. And he looked old, and he was sitting in his chair. And, you know, time had showed itself. And Churchill was greatly offended by the portrait. And he brought it home, and he burned it. And it's been lost to history. He didn't like the reality. But when we read the Bible, we see the good and the bad we see the righteous and the unrighteous acts of people. We don't see people in their idealized version. We see both. The heroes of the Bible are still presented with their mistakes. And that, to me, is confirmation of the truthfulness of it. And it also gives me great hope that as I read a chapter like 2 Samuel 11, which is an incredibly dark and sad chapter in Scripture. You know, there's certain chapters of Scripture that are just really sad, that are really dark, that are like, ooh, that's a hard story. 
story of Tamar is a really dark chapter of Genesis. The story of David here is a really sad story. Some of the chapters you read around the siege of Jerusalem and in Jeremiah and in Lamentations, these are tough chapters to read. You're like, man, that's hard. But it's also real life. And it gives us information that we can use in our life. And so here we have David. David is now king. His throne has been confirmed. Saul is dead. There was a civil war that ran for a period of time. And Ishobeth, Saul's son, winds up being killed. And the kingdom is united under David. Originally, he rules from Hebron. And then afterwards, he takes Jerusalem. He goes through the water cave. I walked and saw that water cave while I was in Jerusalem at the city of David. And it's this narrow water cave that was carved out 5,000 years ago. It's incredible to think that there were people down there 5,000 years ago with bronze-type tools cracking away at rock, just slowly but surely. And then eventually that water tunnel gets diverted under Hezekiah's reign and rerouted in order to better protect it against sieges. But they go through the water tunnel and David takes the city. And they take control of Jerusalem and he reigns in Jerusalem. And if you go to Jerusalem and you see the ruins of the old city where David ruled from is not the walls that you see in modern Jerusalem. That got built up later. The city of David is a small triangular part of the city that's kind of near the top of a hill at a base. And when you go there, they have the ruins. It's the oldest part of the city. And the palace is at the very top of the hill, at the very top of the mountain area, at the top of Zion, if you will. And that's where David was, and that's where he was ruling and reigning from. And then you see multiple layers of houses and buildings and stuff going down and down and down and down the hill. And as you go further down, eventually if you go down, way down, you get to the water tunnel. And so it gives an idea of what we're going to read here when it says, starting in chapter 11, verse 1, In the spring of the year, when kings normally go out to war, David sent Joab, who was the captain of his army, he was his commander-in-chief, if you will, his chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff. That was his top general. That was the guy that was in charge of all of his army. And so he sends Joab and the Israelite army to fight the Ammonites. And they destroyed the Ammonite army and laid siege to the city of Rabbah. However... David stayed behind in Jerusalem. So, in the spring of the year, when kings normally go out to war, that would have been after the harvest season. So when we think about Easter, right now it's Pentecost, or sorry, right now it's Passover. Passover started yesterday. It was the first night of Passover, and for the next week it is Passover. So around the world last night, millions of observant Jewish families gathered together around their tables and they celebrated Passover. The same thing that Jesus did his last night on earth. That year, Passover started on a Thursday. And they gathered around and they had a traditional dinner. It's called a Seder dinner. And right now, Jewish people all over the world are doing that and they're eating unleavened bread for the next seven days. And then they are going to celebrate and sing and remember that they were once slaves in Egypt and the Lord delivered them. And they are going to think about all the ways that God has been merciful to them. And this is a particularly tough Passover for Jewish people around the world because there's still 130 hostages in Hamas's custody. And so they're thinking about that. And they're thinking about the fact that You know, in every generation, in the Passover Seder, as you read it, you know, there's a quote from the Bible that, you know, kind of infers that in every generation, somebody rises up to try to destroy them. And it's more real now than it's been in a long time, because there is an army that has risen up to try to destroy them. And they're once again fighting. 
and they're once again struggling for their security. And it is a hard time to be Jewish. You know, anti-Semitism is at an all-time high. In New York, anti-Semitism has gotten to the point that it's running so rampant that it's no longer safe for Jewish students to go to school at Columbia. And at Yale, they're being blocked. And you have these pro-Palestinian and Hamas groups that have taken over campuses. And Columbia's had to go to Zoom virtual classes because they're unwilling to break up these mobs that are sitting there ready to attack Jewish students. It's a scary time to be Jewish. In a lot of ways, it looks a lot like Nazi Germany did in the 1930s. And it's frightening. And it's scary. And it's against the will of the Lord. And ultimately, hate only breeds more hate. And it's very troubling to see in this Passover season. This, it says here, in the spring of the year. This would have been a little bit after Passover. So typically, kings would go out to war after the harvest. Now, when we think about Passover, Passover ends, and then 50 days later is Pentecost. It's a week of weeks. And that's when the Holy Spirit came. And that's when there was the first harvest. And Pentecost coincides with the last of the harvest of the wheat. And that would signify the end of the harvest season. Once the harvest season was over, the wheat had been harvested, then it would be time for kings to go out and fight. Until then, in the ancient world, you didn't really have wars going on in the early spring. Because you needed your workforce, you needed your labor force, you needed all hands on deck to harvest. It wasn't like today where you got your you know, caterpillars and your international machines and they went out into the field and you know, they harvested everything up and it you know, got dumped into a silo. You had to harvest everything manually and you needed a lot of labor to do it. And so if you went and fought a battle, that meant your crops were going to rot in the ground. And then your people were going to go hungry. So wars didn't get waged until the harvest season was over. Regardless of the country, because you needed to get your food in your warehouses first before you could think about going off to battle. So this would have been late April, early May. And it says, when kings normally go out to war. So this is our first clue that something is amiss. Because every year, kings would go and they would lead. And so, you know, at this point, David's reign has been established. He's ruling, he's reigning in Jerusalem. He's in charge. And he has got his throne. And so, he takes his foot off the gas. You know, I had a manager that used to always say, if you're not growing, you're shrinking. You know, there's no such thing as treading water in business. You know, if you're not growing your bottom line, if you're not doing more, if you're not getting better, you're going backwards. There's no such thing as standing still. You're either getting stronger or you're getting weaker. And if you think you're just standing there, you're actually getting weaker. You're only deceiving yourself. You know, the minute you stop learning, the minute you stop training, the minute you stop striving is the minute that you start to go backwards. That's true in everything. You know, if you stop going to the gym, it's not going to be long before you don't look the same way, before you're not as strong as you were before, before your muscles start to go away. You know, they don't just stay there. You know, if you stop taking care of your property or your house, it's not long before weeds start popping up and things start breaking and, you know, you got bugs that start infesting. I mean, you, you got to actively, continually manage it. Otherwise, it goes backwards. And so we see here, it says, When kings normally go out to war, David sent Joab and the Israelite army to fight the Ammonites. He doesn't go. It says, however, David stayed in Jerusalem. He took his foot off the gas. He decided to coast. He said to himself, you know, for whatever reason, I don't feel like it. Maybe he just, you know, decided he'd had enough of it. Maybe he thought he would take it easy that year. Don't know. But he wasn't where he was supposed to be. This whole story starts with him not being where he was supposed to be. You know, the amazing thing about life is that if you are busy doing the right thing, 
if you are actively doing the correct thing, the godly thing, the thing God wants you to do, there's no time for you to do the wrong thing. There's no ability for you to go and do something you're not supposed to do because you're busy doing the right thing. But once you become idle, once you stop doing the right thing, was it, what's the old idle time is the devil's workshop? James says, therefore, to the one who, do, who knows the right thing to do and does not do it, to him it is sin. It's a sin of omission. Sin of omission is almost worse than the sin of commission because when you're doing a sin of omission, you're purposely not doing what you know you should be doing. Which then leads you to do something that you shouldn't do. So it's almost a double sin. Because one, you're not doing what you know you should do, and then you wind up doing something you shouldn't do. You know? You wind up, you wind up going backwards twice. And so he's failing to do right here. He's failing to do what he should be doing, which is leading. Leading his men. And David is a guy that has a heart for the Lord, and he's a strong warrior. And so it's probably a blind spot for him. You know, a lot of times the areas where the devil is most adept at taking us down are areas that we excel in because we don't guard them as closely. And our pride is there to go, oh, I'm good with that. I don't need help around that. That's something, I, I got that part. I don't need accountability there. I need accountability over here. And because of that, it's a weak spot. Well, I don't struggle with that. But then you take your eye off of it. And before you know it, you do struggle with it. Because you're not paying attention. And Paul writes about this in 1 Corinthians. He says, Therefore, let him who thinks he stands take heed that he does not fall. It's easy to think that we're doing good. And to become prideful in it. Paul warns about it. He says, therefore, let him who thinks he stand take heed lest he fall. We have to constantly be on the lookout. We have to constantly be aware. Because the minute that we stop being aware, the minute that we stop defending who we are, the minute that we stop chasing God is the minute that we're like the gazelle that stops running with the pack. And he's alone. And then every nature video you've ever seen shows you what happens. You know, the lion doesn't ever get the fastest and the strongest one in the pack. The lion gets the one that's not paying attention. <clears throat> that's the one the lion eats. He only needs to eat one. That's all he needs. You don't want to be that one. And so, however, David stayed behind in Jerusalem. Now when the evening came or the late afternoon, depending on your translation. David got out of bed and was walking on the roof of the palace. Well, here's another sign that things aren't going correct in David's day. You know, Proverbs says, a little slumber, a little sleep, and your poverty will come to you. The Holy Spirit is intentional in putting in here that David's schedule is out of kilter. He's sleeping all day. He's not even getting up until the late evening. He's got to be partying all night. Wow. I mean, if he's sleeping all day, that means he had to have been up all night the night before, drinking, partying, hanging out, doing whatever. But his schedule is off. He is not running a country overnight. He is not ruling and reigning in the wee hours of the night. It's not like they got 24-hour cable TV and electricity and he can pick up the telephone and run the show. If he's up overnight, he's not administering, he's not looking at his flocks, he's not looking at his crops, he's not inspecting buildings, he's not going out and looking at things. He is in bed during daylight hours. He's not doing what he's supposed to be doing. Not only is he not at war, but he's sleeping all day. He's just completely doing what he wants to do. 
And he, David gets out of bed and he's walking on the roof of the palace. And so this makes sense as I was talking about the city, the ancient city of Jerusalem, David's city. The palace was at the top and the views would have been all the way down. So he would have had a vantage point to be able to look downward towards the rest of the city. So it would have been easy for him to see as it goes and he looks out over the city and he notices a woman of unusual beauty taking a bath and he sent someone to find out who she was and he was told she is Bathsheba, the daughter of Eliam and the wife of Uriah the Hittite. Now Uriah, as we learn in earlier scripture, is one of David's mighty men. So David has top guys that are his top lieutenants that lead and direct groups of soldiers. And so he's got a couple dozen of these guys that are his elite. They're his best warriors. Uriah is one of them. David knows Uriah. David trusts Uriah. David has given other troops to Uriah to command. Not only is this somebody that he sees, but he finds out and he knows in advance that this is one of his friend's wives. Makes it all the worse, doesn't it? I mean, it's bad enough if it's a stranger. That's bad. But sleeping with one of your friend's wives? Like that's just, it's another level of low, right? And you can't really pacify somebody when, you know, that's the one thing that Proverbs warns you. It's like an arrow piercing your liver because, you know, if you steal from somebody, you can pay them back. You can appease them. But if you sleep with somebody's wife, there's really nothing you can offer them that will ever put the flames of that anger out. That's why so many murders involve crimes of passion that deal with romance and love triangles. Because it's the thing that you can't pay your way out of, that you can't bribe your way out of, that you can't reason your way out of, because it's this emotional, it's love, and it's betrayal. And so he hears that it is Uriah's wife. And then David sent messengers to get her. No hesitation. No thinking about it. Oh, it's Uriah the Hittite's wife. Send a messenger. Send her over here. And when she came to the palace, he slept with her. She had just completed the purification rites. And then she returned home, and later, when Bathsheba discovered that she was pregnant, she sent David a message saying, I'm pregnant. This is a problem for David because Uriah is where he's supposed to be. He's off fighting a battle. He's off at war. So the question's going to turn up, how'd you get pregnant? You know, Unless she's going to go with an immaculate conception story, it's going to be tough to sell. And she's going to wind up confessing, she's going to wind up getting stoned, he's going to have a huge problem here. And he knows it. So now he's got to cover it up. Instead of repenting, instead of turning to the Lord and going, Lord, help me, I have done this evil thing. No. There's still no confession here. There's still no admitting here, hey, I've done the wrong thing. Now comes the human cover-up. And he covers it up for a while, we're going to see, because he sends for Uriah. And he brings Uriah to the palace under the guise of, I want a report of the battle. And he gives him the report, and then he goes, great, go home, see your wife, wash your feet. He sends a gift after probably a big feast. You know, hey, you're home, have a big meal, see your wife. So he sends sends Uriah back to his house. But Uriah, so loyal, so faithful, so committed, refuses to go see his wife. He sleeps at the palace with the bodyguard and says, how? Could I go and have a feast and spend time with my wife while we're at war? And my, my brothers in arms are out busy fighting. I could never do such a thing. All right. 
That didn't work. Strike one for David. All right, we got to come up with a plan B. He goes, well, tell you what, stay here another day or two, and then I'll send you back to the front. So that night, David has him at the, at the palace for dinner. And he gets them all liquored up. Gives them a bunch of wine. They have a big feast. He gets them good and drunk. And he figures, if I get them drunk, maybe I can send them home, and then he'll sleep with his wife. Right? Or maybe at least he won't remember, you know, but he can spend the night with his wife, wake up with her, and... You know, either way, we can make that work. We just, we got to get them in the bed together overnight. We got to make that happen. So he gets them all liquored up. Even then, Uriah refuses to go home to his wife. He goes, I can't do it. And he stays at the palace. Human scheme breakdown number two. It's not working out for David here. I mean, he's coming up with good ideas. They're the kind of ideas that you would come up with of your own strength when you're trying to solve a problem. But it doesn't work. So now David goes all in. And he writes a message that he gives to Uriah that he says, you need to hand to Joab. It's an important message regarding the battle. What Uriah doesn't know is that it's his own death warrant. He writes out a message that says, hey, send Uriah to the fiercest part of the fighting, and then flee and withdraw and leave him to be killed. Murder. Cold-blooded, premeditated murder. Not manslaughter, not it was an accidental discharge. No, there is a whole conspiracy around it. And the worst part is, is that he hands it to Uriah to deliver himself. And Uriah, the loyal, faithful soldier that he is, he goes and he delivers it, and he is struck down. And he is murdered. And the Lord is furious with David. And ultimately, there's terrible consequences for David. And it is heartbreaking to see the fall. You know, when you read Psalm 101, David is at the peak of his purity in loving the Lord. And he says, I will not know a wicked person. He goes on, he goes, I will set no worthless thing before my eyes. I hate the work of those who fall away. It shall not fasten its grip to me. A perverse heart shall depart from me. I will know no evil. It's amazing to think that David wrote that at his best. And at his worst, he's ordering the death of one of his closest friends. What a swing. And David's a guy that knows the Lord. David's a guy that you know, we're going to see in heaven one day. Amen. It's amazing to think the things that even those that know the Lord are capable of doing when they stop pursuing the Lord, when they stop chasing the Lord, when they stop loving and hanging fully focused on God. And so the Lord does a bunch of things. He convicts him of his sin. That doesn't work. And then... He starts chastising them. There's a bunch of psalms that David writes, like Psalm 28, where he talks about feeling sick and his bones feeling crushed. And the Lord does that when we sin and we refuse to repent, right? There's all sorts of things that start happening in our lives. Sometimes they're financial. Sometimes they're health. Sometimes they're family. But the Lord tries to draw us back to Him. Just like it says in Hebrews, for those whom the Lord loves, He disciplines and he scourges every son whom he receives. When you do wrong, he tries to draw you back. David refuses. Eventually, he sends Nathan the prophet. There's a story. Oh, that's you. Finally, David repents. Amen. But he bears a heavy burden. He knows nothing but war for the rest of his reign. He winds up with a very dysfunctional family. He winds up with all sorts of problems. And it all starts from him being in the wrong place at the wrong time, looking at the wrong thing. And disaster follows. Fix your eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith. Keep your focus on the Lord. Because when you look to the left or you look to the right, when you start looking the wrong way, 
disaster can occur. I don't care how strong a Christian you think you are. David was a man after God's own heart. I doubt that there's anybody in here, me included, Marshall included, all of us included, that have a heart for God like David did. And yet, he still managed to fall when he stopped focusing on God. Focus on the Lord. Take heed lest you fall. Amen. Let's pray. Almighty Father, Heavenly King, Lord, thank you for today. Father God, thank you for the stories of David. Lord, thank you that you offer us forgiveness and redemption even in our worst moments. Thank you, Lord, that you will provide for us even when we have sinned against you. Oh Lord, tonight I pray that if there is someone here who has never repented, who has never come to know you, that tonight would be the night, Lord. That as we have our heads bowed, they would just pray, Dear Jesus, I need you. I am a sinner. And I have broken your law. And tonight I come and I ask you to forgive me. I ask you to save me. Father, your word says you sent your son to die for me and that he rose again from the dead and that he rules and reigns, and tonight I confess that to be truth, and I ask you to save me. Lord, I pray that each and every one of us in this room would keep our eyes on you this week, that we would draw close to you, that you would draw close to us, that you would keep us on your perfect path, Lord, that you would keep us far from evil, Lord, and that we would entertain no wicked thing, but we would seek to wholly devote ourselves to you and your will, lest we stumble and fall. Almighty Father, Heavenly King, Lord, it is in the matchless name of Yeshua, Messiah Jesus, I pray. Amen.